hear me? I think. Yeah, so I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear him, Rocky? Yes, I can hear him very clearly. Okay, good. Well, the others will join us when they do. So uh, let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you for this um, opportunity to get together to learn more about missions and especially uh, today about missions and cross-cultural ministry. We pray for wisdom and insight. Help us to remain true to the scriptures. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, this uh, particular course or this particular lecture today, <clears throat> we're going to be discussing uh, cross-cultural ministry. Um, and we'll define, you know, what is cross-cultural ministry, uh, how we go about doing that. And again, we're going to look at cross-cultural ministry and uh, the examples of it in the book of Acts with the Apostle Paul, how, how that uh, came about. So let's go ahead and go here let's see there all right well um i uh sometimes teach in indonesia on the island of timor in west timor on the indonesian side and there's a small island just to the southwest of uh west timor uh that's called uh rote and there, the Rote is probably no more than about 30 or 40 kilometers long and maybe at, at its width, 20 kilometers wide. And there are at least 14 language groups, not just dialects, but languages on that island. And so uh, every... Every language has a particular culture attached to it. And so it is a very, very, very multicultural place uh, where uh, you live. Uh, you have many cultures as well. I know in the Philippines, uh, just across the whole island uh, nation, you have so many cultures. Uh, Rocky there in Mindanao, you've got a number of cultures, of uh, different peoples, tribes that you may be from. Uh, you'll you'll find that Matthew in, in Cambodia as well, and and you know wherever we go, there are very very many cultures. And how how does the gospel spread from one culture to another? And and how do we intentionally work to bring the gospel to the nations? It's one thing for us to minister the gospel just to our people, uh, the particular people that. Uh, we may be from. Uh, for me, uh, you know, it might be Americans, but in America, we have so many different cultures. And uh, if, you know, some people, okay, we'll only do to this particular people group or that particular people group. My heritage is that I have ancestors from Scotland, Ireland, England, France, the Netherlands, um uh, sweden spain and so a lot of western and northern europe but those are all different cultures you know ministry in scotland is going to be different from ministry in sweden and ministry in sweden is going to be different than ministry in spain and so uh it helps to understand uh how we minister from one culture to another but also too something that we see in the new testament as the gospel's going out uh it was going from jerusalem to judea to samaria to the other most parts of the earth and the churches that were being gathered together included people both from jewish backgrounds jewish culture and uh the various pagan cultures around them the various nations brought in and they're brought together in the church and sometimes there are tensions. Uh, you know, every culture has its own ideas, its own assumptions, uh, and way of looking at the world. We have our likes and our dislike. 
we deal with marriage differently. We deal with children and raising a children differently. And, you know, uh, you know, the foods we like to eat and so forth. Um, it's just all different. And, and so therefore, how do we get along together in the church if we're coming from different cultures? Um, how will we bring these peoples together to band together and form a close knit community that holds tightly, not only to their own cultures and traditions, but also that we are now in Christ and how much of the old culture and tradition do we let go? Now, how much of it do we get rid of because of its pagan roots? And how much do, are we able to uh, retain? That is a that is a question that we have to wrestle with and to understand how best to do ministry. Well, uh, what we want to do is look at the biblical precedent for cross-cultural ministry from the book of Acts. Um, Acts speaks a cross-cultural mission. You have Israel, the, the church under the Old Testament, is now set to preach the gospel to the Gentile nations. And the gospel now travels across uh, different cultures, different, different ethnicities, different languages, different ethics, different moral boundaries. And so the book of Acts provides some important lessons on the challenges and the dangers of how ministry in cross-cultural settings uh, should and, and should not go. And so we're going to consider today some of the key events as we see them in the book of Acts. Um, you remember in the book of Acts, the, the, it is a, a story of cross-cultural mission from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the othermost parts of uh, the earth. Uh, it starts in Jewish culture. It spreads from Jerusalem and Israel into the Gentile world up in Antioch, and you have others in other places going. And so now the Jewish church has to consider cultural and, and uh, social changes as the gospel is leading to the conversion of, of, uh, of these Gentile peoples. And this is not something that occurred naturally for the Jewish church. This was something that was disturbing for many people. Uh, there are those who said, no, in order for you to become a, a Christian, you're going to have to become a Jew like us. And in the sense of submission to the Old Testament law uh, and for the males to be circumcised and you live under the commands, just as we have done. That, that was their thinking. In order to be a Christian, you're going to have to be a Jew. And the message of the gospel is, no, the just shall live by faith. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, you remember they had the decision at the council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, where they said that, you know, we're not going to lay any burden on our Gentile brothers uh, with regards to the law. It was something that we, could, we had trouble keeping. So why are we trying to impose that upon uh, the Gentile believers? Uh, at, at the beginning, the church held on to the old cultural Jewish forms. And even after the decision of the Jerusalem Council, I imagine it probably took a few generations for uh, the church to have a, a, an identity that they were the church and not primarily Jewish um, in that. And, and also, as we see the gospel spread, you see churches with more and more Gentiles coming in. And you have fewer and fewer of the Jews who are a part of the church itself. It's a slow process through the theological and cultural implications uh, as they become clear and as those things are applied and, and lived out. So let's talk about Acts chapter 10. Initially, the early church continued to operate in the culture in which it was born, primarily amongst Jewish uh, people, though they might have uh, moved to other places, Antioch and uh, other places throughout the world. And, and even the Apostle Paul, in his ministry, when he would go into a new town, a new city, he would go first to the Jews. He would go first to the synagogues. He would find them. They have had the scriptures 
uh, all these years. He could preach the concepts of of Messiah, and 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 he could point to the scriptures with them, and they had accepted the scriptures as coming from God. Uh, this was uh, truly God's word, and so therefore, uh, Paul didn't have to go th and establish a foundation uh, in which to operate and to explain things to people, because that was already there. It was already there for them amongst the Jews. Now, depending on the reception of this message and of Paul's ministry to them, uh, you know, he he might eventually withdraw from the synagogue and go to the Jews. We've seen that. He, he would shake the dust. You know, we shake the dust off our feet and he, they move to another place. Or, uh, you know, the Gentiles had received the message that, you know, hey, we've been included in, in God's uh, mercies and grace in Christ. And, and so it was a more fruitful field uh, for Paul to labor in amongst the Gentiles because it had been rejected primarily uh, by the Jews. So to the Jew first and then to the Greek, that was Paul's approach as we have seen. Um, but the Jewish groups uh, initially, uh, you know, in Jerusalem, they observed the Jewish customs. They met at the temple, according to Acts chapter four. Uh, they continue to observe the food laws uh, so Peter, when he's on the rooftop there at Joppa, and he has that vision of this great sheet or sail, some think it was, with all these animals, both clean and, and, and unclean there, and the voice says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And some of these are unclean animals, according to Jewish food laws. Um, you know, so he was still practicing this. Uh, at the time, you have uh, circumcision still being practiced as well. So these things were no longer theologically necessary, okay, uh, with the coming of the gospel. And after Acts chapter 15, it was a realization, it's no longer theologically necessary for me as an ethnic Jew to observe the dietary laws. That was what uh, Jewish believers were faced with, they were still just a culture. This was just part of their culture. And even though they might be able to have uh, foods that were unclean, you know, such as maybe eating prawns or, or eating pork, um, uh, they would still, you know, theologically they knew they could, but just as far as their, uh, likes and dislikes and their assumptions and just it was not something they were accustomed to uh, and it wouldn't have been sin for them to eat it but they would have been uh they're they're still like, uh, i i don't know if i necessarily want to uh to uh eat that so uh this was something that um uh the early church faced uh, up until the time of Stephen being martyred in Acts chapter 7, most of the mission of the church had been carried out in Jerusalem. And when persecution forces the church to scatter, uh, the process of taking the gospel to the world begins. Uh, it was preached in Judea and Samaria and then the whole of the world. You see the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. You see the gospel being taken to Antioch. And then, of course, we know later the, the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul coming out of the church at Antioch. And so the nature of, of those who are converted to the faith changes from coming from Jewish backgrounds to now also including those from the uh, Gentile backgrounds. You see initially in Acts, Samaritans being brought in, okay, and others uh, as well being led in. In Acts chapter 10, you see the conversion of Cornelius. He was the Roman centurion, and this is an illustration of how things have shifted and, and the bringing in of the gospel to uh, the Gentiles. Um, through this event in Acts 10, Cornelius and Peter and later the whole church 
is now forced to to radically rethink their whole theology uh, and their lifestyle and their mission. And as a faithful Jew, Peter had kept the food laws. They were laws given to teach the Jews the distinction between clean and unclean. And as part of this, it prevented the Jews from from mixing uh, with the immoral and culturally unclean Gentiles as well. You, they wouldn't have sit down and have table fellowship with them over a meal. And, and therefore, they were protected uh, in that way from the influence of the Gentiles. Then God commands Peter uh, to go with these three Gentile men who had been sent by Cornelius after Cornelius has this vision. And Peter obeys and he preaches the gospel to Cornelius and those who are gathered to hear him, hear the apostle Peter at uh, Cornelius's house and the Holy Spirit comes down upon these people. They're converted. They hear the message of the gospel and, and believe. Uh, and, you know, as the spirit is poured out upon these people, uh, salvation is now becoming evident. It is now also something for Gentiles, uh, that they too may receive this good news and believe upon Christ. And so Peter baptizes them. Uh, and through these actions, God changes both the cultural and the theological nature of the church and of the convert. So uh, looking at that particular process, you remember Peter uh, was taught not to call anything unclean. And that was part of the vision. Uh, with the outpouring of the Spirit, uh, the terms of the vision up on that housetop that Peter receives uh, there in Joppa teaches him to call no food profane or unclean if God pronounces it clean. All right, that's, that's with food. But Peter very quickly grasps the analogy. He, he sees what what the Lord is driving at here, uh, trying to get a, the message across to him, it's not just about food. It's about people. It's about these nations. And so uh, uh, because of their lack of scruples in food matters, the Gentiles were ritually unsafe people for a very religious Jew to meet with socially. Um, uh, and so, but now that has been removed uh, by the Lord under the gospel. And so the Lord impresses this message upon Peter's mind and heart. And full acceptance of the Gentiles and the God's people is now based uh, upon the Holy Spirit being poured out upon them. And so Peter sees, look, all these external things about the food, uh, uh, that separated the clean from the unclean is now replaced by the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And so those who had the inward work of the Spirit within their hearts were considered clean and accepted. And so no further act or rituals were needed. So this is a new thing for Peter. It's going to take a little bit for that to kind of, just like anytime we have a new concept, it, it takes a bit to work its way from our head and we understand the implications and then the living out of it and how it affects our our particular assumptions. You know, uh, if, if we, let's say we come from a particular people group that has had a long history of animosity with another people group. And you take an individual from this group and an individual from that group and they're now brought together in, in Christ in the church. It, there still might be a little bit of the, uh, I don't know if I want to, you know, this is a bit different here. Uh, when I was a chaplain in the, in the army, I had a chaplain's assistant and an enlisted man who was an American Indian. And he came from one particular tribe, the Kiowas. And uh, the Kiowas and another group called the Osage did not get along well because of history between their peoples going back some 200, 250 years. And so carrying those particular grudges at times. And it, it, it was something in the gospel that, that my assistant had to overcome. He, he was a believer. And uh, 
had to overcome that. But there was all just kind of that culturally, oh, wait a minute, that's an Osage. Uh, I don't know if I want to be his friend or not, just because of that. Well, with the gospel coming in, it breaks down all those barriers, tears those things down, and we are now joined together as a new people in Christ Jesus. And so uh, Peter has to think about his own theology, his own practice, and so forth. And so you can imagine when he is there in Cornelius's house and the Holy Spirit is being poured out upon these Gentile believers, and, and Peter immediately goes, okay, they, they've received the Spirit. Those who receive the Spirit, these, these people are baptized and brought into the, the church. Therefore, baptism must be applied to them. I imagine, you know, it, it took a bit after Peter had done this, and he goes back to Jerusalem, and some people are kind of like, oh, Peter, we heard about this incident in Caesarea. What's up with that? And he has to explain to the assembly gathered there. And everyone, you imagine the people sitting there going, hmm. And, and, and they're left with, God has now also brought eternal life to the nations, to the Gentiles. They too are part of this church. And I imagine it wasn't something that immediately people quickly embrace that, you know, we, we can embrace a concept here in our minds, but it kind of takes a while and practice for us to, to embrace that. And I imagine that's probably what may have occurred there. Um, and on top of that, not only was he a Gentile, he was a Roman. He, he, was, he was a Roman centurion. He was part of the occupying force so think of it this way. I'm going to let, let's go to uh, Philippine, the history of the Philippines. When the Japanese came in, uh, in the Second World War to the Philippines, they were the enemy. But imagine if some of the Japanese had been converted under the gospel and now to be part of the church, part of that occupying force. That was like, I imagine on the part of people from the Philippines, they were like, oh, what, what, what did we do now? How, how, do we, how do we embrace this? How do, we, how do we deal with this? That's kind of the, think about this with the, with the conversion of, of uh, Cornelius. And so the mission was not just church extension. We're, 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 we're planting additional churches out there, uh, but it was something that was more costly, more revolutionary, more radical, more revolutionary. Peter's mission defined his theology and forced theological and cultural changes. And so uh, the, this challenge then can be put to the mission church in this way. Will the church simply try to stamp its own cultural identity upon the new converts? Or will it be the Spirit's leading cause um, uh, to cause it to reflect upon its own spiritual life and conduct? So that leads us to principle uh, 29. Uh, we talk about the New Testament church. It struggled with integration, integration of people from different cultures and backgrounds. Um, it was not an easy process. Uh, it was something, though, that had to be taught by the Spirit of God. It was the Holy Spirit who would work to bring them together. If we're relying upon our own thinking, our own approach, that's not going to happen. You know, you, you look at the United Nations and how divided they are. Well, only God's Spirit is going to bring people together from different cultures and backgrounds and so forth doesn't mean it's going to be easy it's going to be it's going to be different and and there'll be certain things that might irritate us culturally that the other group does uh, but we have to stop and say okay why am i irritated by it is it because of culture or is it because of christ and you know we you know is this something that's a sin no it's not a sin uh, and I need to be 
careful that I don't do things that would irritate them, that would offend them unnecessarily. If there's any offense, let it be because of the gospel and not because of my culture or my practices and my uh, my preferences. So uh, God's spirit is the one who has to bring us. And that is where we have to submit to Christ. We have to say, Lord, come and change us, whatever. And that may be uncomfortable for us, how we do things, how we've lived in certain ways, how our assumptions and so forth. Um, that's one of the things that often happens when a missionary goes uh, from their home culture to a new culture. And depending how different that culture is, it can create a bit of a shock, a uh, culture shock, we we call it. Um, you know, it, 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 it would be different. You know, I, I am I am from the United States. I'm from the southern part of the United States. And if I moved to another region in the United States, there would be some cultural differences, but it's not too different. Our laws are the same for the most part. Uh, we all drive on the same side of the road. Uh, we, you know, we, most of the foods that we eat are available around around the nation, although we might have particular recipes of preparing certain foods that we like in the Southern United States that are different from other places and so forth. Um, but we're about the same. When my wife and I moved to Australia in 2016 as missionaries uh, for a short term, uh, yeah, there were some, some things that were different in Australia, but the language is the same, although the accent is different. Uh, they drive on the opposite side of the road, but it's something we got accustomed to. Now, it was really def difficult when we go back to visit family in the United States, and we would find ourselves driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and well, oops, got, we got to go back to the correct to the North American side. Um, but by and large, for the most part, it was not quite a shock. Now, if I had moved to India, it would be quite different. And if you had been taken out of your home culture and put into something just totally different, the language is different, the assumptions people have are different, their, their world and life view is different, uh, the environment, the climate is different, and so forth. Let's say, it, it, you know, it, it, if Rocky were to come from Mindanao, and he was now going to have to minister to native peoples in northern Canada, I imagine it would be quite a shock, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> it would be a shock. And so these are the kinds of factors we have to pray, Lord, help me to these changes, these differences. We all have our preferences, the things that make us comfortable. But we have to pray, Lord, come and, and work in my heart. Change me so that I might uh, serve you. And so... Principle 30, uh, here, mission churches must understand that the mission of the church not only blesses the nation, but also brings blessings to the church. Uh, by the Holy Spirit's leading, salvation is brought, and the missionaries are led into a deeper understanding of the truth. And so this mutual and reciprocal process is led by the Holy Spirit as we are gathered together. And so uh, uh, learning to be in another culture as the Holy Spirit is working in us and in our brothers and sisters who may be from a different culture, and we're being brought together and led by God's Spirit, there's going to be blessings for us as well as part of the body of Christ. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Well, let's talk about Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, you know, there are the radical changes beginning with Peter. And Cornelius in Acts 10 now, Acts 13 and following, we see the uh, great changes as the Apostle Paul is carrying the gospel. He uh, went deep into the Gentile world, into a completely different ethic, ethic and ethnic and spiritual culture. The, the thousand-year Jewish practices or, or longer 
of, of, of circumcision and separation from the Gentile peoples and Sabbath observance and food restrictions and daily activities. They didn't practice those kinds of things in the Gentile world. You know, some cultures did have circumcision, but it, it didn't mean the same thing uh, as it was to the Jews. Um, from, so a cultural point of view, the Jew and Gentile, they just don't think the same. They, they just don't think alike. And so the different cultural heritages affect the church in every level. Uh, uh, the difficulties of how Jewish and Gentile Christians would have related to one another, it, for instance, the, the church in uh, uh, the four provinces uh, consisted almost entirely of Gentiles ignorant of the Jewish tradition. Uh, so in, in what is now Greece and part of, of Bulgaria, the gospel going into Macedonia and Achaia and, and so forth, you know, the, these are totally different cultures there. There are some Jews in these places, but the whole Greek mindset was totally different from that of the Jewish mindset back in Palestine. So if a Christian from Macedonia or Achaia go to Jerusalem, uh, they must have been like, oh, wow, this is different. There's a whole different atmosphere, whole different culture and way of, of life there. Um, and, and, and the community is as unlike that to which he was accustomed as it's possible to imagine. So in Achaia or, or Macedonia in a church there, um, the Jewish component of the church might have been very, very small. So it's predominantly Gentile. He goes to Jerusalem and it's the exact opposite. And he's the minority now. It's the it's the Jewish culture that is now the majority culture in that situation, you know. And and how the Jews had carried themselves, the strictness and the and the res, as a reserve on their part must have dismayed him. Uh, Christianity in Jerusalem must have seemed like a thing of rules, hardly distinguishable from pure uh, Judaism. People might have been following some of these same uh, Jewish laws now no longer on, from a theological basis, but from a cultural basis. But sometimes our assumption of things uh, might be be quite different in how things are received. Uh, you know, somebody might look at our particular observance of something and think it's a religious matter when it's just something of our culture. Uh, and, and, but sometimes we are so accustomed to doing things in a certain way, in a certain manner, we have to ask, is this theology or is this culture? You know, is this something that is driven by God, the Holy Spirit, or is it driven because of what makes me feel comfortable? And things have always been uh, this particular way. And so in the, in the synagogue worship uh, and in the early church, if he's there in Palestine, the prayers are modeled after Jewish practice. Uh, how, the tunes to which they might have sung the Psalms uh, were old Jewish uh, Palestinian tunes, uh, and and so it's something that is totally uh, different. So the the only real points of contact between the Gentile believer and the Jewish believer would be a common devotion to Christ, that He is at the center. And that is the one thing. When we forget that Jesus is the reason why we are together as a church and that we have to be governed by God, the Holy Spirit, in accordance with the Word of God, that's where we begin to have trouble. Your culture, my culture, my likes and dislikes, your likes and dislikes, your practices, my practices, all must be brought to the standard of Scripture and the Holy Spirit as he guides, as we're reading the word and praying and seeking, seeking counsel, that is the, that becomes now the new culture. Now, how one might sing the Psalms in Scotland might be different from the way one sings the Psalms in Mindanao or in Cambodia. You might have various tunes 
that you're accustomed to. You might not use certain tunes, tunes or, or certain instruments um, because of their association with old uh, demon worship practices. And that varies from culture to culture and culture and so forth. And it can be upsetting, you know, if you come from a culture where certain types of drums and drumming and, and is used to summon demons, and you go into a, a, another culture and they're using drums, and that doesn't mean anything to them, but you're going, what is this? Um, you're going to have to understand what something means in one culture doesn't mean the same thing in another culture. And you're going to have to work on that instead of immediately oh no no they use drums so i oh oh you know, we can't we can't participate in worship with them uh it just means that okay for me this is the background to it i want others to be sensitive and we need to be sensitive to other people's backgrounds and not give offense needlessly and how we go about doing things um you imagine uh, many of the uh, of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Once you would bring in a Gentile convert, that's a bit of a strange thing. It it, it it's it's like ooh, I, I I'm not sure about this. It would be quite a novelty. Uh, it would be quite different. Um, but it would be something that is uh, uh, you'd have to become accustomed to. Uh, but to understand, this is my brother in Christ. It doesn't matter what culture, what ethnicity, what language. He's my brother in Christ. And that's what I focus on, and that's what I treasure and, and what he has given. And so I need to be careful that I don't put up walls where God has torn them down in Christ Jesus. Uh, when a Christian from Jerusalem would say, go to Corinth, uh, the shock might have been even more severe. Uh, the Corinthian in, in Judea would find himself in a society that was stiff uh, and formal, and, and the Jewish Christians in Corinth must have thought that the church there was given over to unbridled license and, and how they do things. And uh, uncircumcised Christians attending the feasts of their pagan friends and in, in, in temples and, and every letter of the ceremonial law is just broken by these Gentiles and, and Christians in Corinth. Um, even in the meeting of the church, preaching and prayers are built upon a strange system of thought that could hardly be called Christian in their thinking. And so um, there, would, there would be that issue, that problem as well. And so the differences in cultures and practice might make the various cultures suspicious of one another. Can the Jews really trust the Gentiles? Uh, would this new Jewish culture not swap out the old Jewish ways? And, and what would happen if some of the old Jewish safeguards are removed? Uh, would, would this lead to immorality and idolatry entering into the church? How could Jews have fellowship with these Gentiles? And so there was this great danger. If the churches did not culturally conform, they could be excommunicated. And that's the radical context of missions in the New Testament. And so Paul notes this distinction and he accepts it. This is, this is the environment in which he has to minister. He has to operate. And so Paul believed that each of the churches could and should develop independently, although they're interconnected together as part of the body of Christ. And there is a diversity uh, amongst the churches, not in doctrine and not according to the basic principles of worship lined out for us in Scripture, not on uh, not uh, a diversity of of ethics because that's rooted in God's word. Uh, but we all have 
according to the culture and environment that we're in, it's not to be the same every every place, every place. Um, are you familiar with the fast food restaurant called McDonald's? Um, yeah, and it, different places around the world, or let's say KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC Chicken. Um, when my parents were in Europe one time visiting and they, uh, they've been eating great uh, banquet type food every day on board the ship that they were on and they landed in Spain. I said, oh, what, you know, what, what great Spanish food did you have? And they said, well, we went to McDonald's. I said, what? <laughs> they said, well, we knew that it would, the food would be similar to what we have back home. It would be similar. Uh, one time when I was in Kuala Lumpur uh, teaching, uh, my students and I, would we would go out for lunch every day. We were in downtown KL. And uh, we would, uh, the students, we would go to different restaurants there to eat lunch together. Uh, and it was their choice. And the last day or next to last day I was there, the students said, Mr. Butler, we're going to take you to a Scottish restaurant. I thought, oh, okay, this this is going to be different. And uh, so we're going through the streets and the alleys there in, in KL, and we turn a corner, and it's McDonald's. And McDonald is a Scottish name. And so I just laughed. I said, oh, guys, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is good. Uh, and they said, look, we want you to tell us, does the food taste the same as it does in the United States? Is Are we getting a real McDonald's hamburger or are we getting a, uh, a Malaysian version of this? So I went in and ordered what I would customarily order if I went to a McDonald's and I ate that, that set. And I was like, you know, you close your eyes and it, it, it's all the same. And I said, guys, you're, you're getting the real thing. Here and there, oh, good. You know, we, you know, it's, it's nice to know. I'm like, okay. We cannot standardize the church in that way from culture to culture. We have the standard of scripture, we have the standard of uh, the biblical principles, the regular principle of worship and how we worship. We have the ethics of God's word, but it, it's going to, how it's, how it's um, lived out might be a little different from culture to culture to culture to culture. That's okay. Uh, and, and we need to be careful that I don't impose my culture on you. You don't impose your culture and the expectations on me. We, we hold each other accountable to the word of God. But we need to separate out, is this because I, I, I might object to it because it's, it's not biblical? Or am I objecting to it because it makes me uncomfortable because it's not my culture? And sometimes people kind of mix the two up. And we need to learn to, to discern in that way. Um, and so Paul operates under that. He, he thinks a new Gentile convert should not be forced into following Jewish customs. And at the same time, Paul is eager not to give offense to either group unnecessarily. And he actively tries to maintain the unity of the church. And so... Paul also adapts the message that, uh, in his preaching to Jews and Gentiles. Now, salvation is the same as through Jesus Christ all throughout. But he has to understand the Jews, for instance, in preaching to them, they've had, they've had the scriptures for all these years. They, they, they begin with that assumption, that world and life view, that mindset. They've been trained to think this way. And the concept of Messiah and so forth is entirely new and resurrection from the dead. You know, although you did have some Jews, the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection, and and, and then you had the Pharisees who did. You know, Paul being a Pharisee, he's going to, and of course, as a believer in Christ, he, he can preach the resurrection. Uh, ministering to Gentiles, unless they have been in the synagogue as a God-fearer, and hearing the scriptures and beginning to grasp these concepts and ideas, um, some of the people Paul's going to minister to 
it's going to be entirely, totally new. They've had no exposure to the scriptures. They've had no exposure to these ideas and concepts. And so you look at the preaching of the Apostle Paul um, at the Areopagus, Mars Hill in Athens, and he's quoting from some of the pagan Greek philosophers and poets to bolster his points and what he is making. Uh, and But then the concept of, res, you know, uh, that Christ is going to return and judge the world and God's given evidence of this by raising him from the dead. As soon as they heard about the resurrection, they were, uh, some of them laughed him at scorn because the whole concept of resurrection was ludicrous to, was, was silly uh, to uh, the Gentile Greek way of thinking. Your idea was that you died, your body, your spirit would ascend to a higher plane of existence as, because the body, the world, material things were, were somehow bad. And, and so why would you want to return, uh, they would say, to the pigsty, uh, the pig pen uh, that you've been taken from? And so the, the idea of resurrection. And, and in fact, um, some think, you know, when, uh, when, when the, those authorities in Athens took him to uh, the Areopagus, you know, say so he seems to be a um, preacher preaching some strange gods and so forth to them. I think when he talks about the resurrection, Anastasia, uh, thinking, is this the name of a, of a goddess or something? Um, in that particular context. So Paul is very careful. Um, for instance, when he's preaching at the, at the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, it's to a primarily Jewish audience. And so how he, how he proclaims the gospel message to them is going to be different from what he does in Acts 17 there at the Areopagus with a primarily Gentile audience that has no background in the scriptures himself. Now he's preaching Jesus in both places. He's preaching the, the truth of the gospel in both places. It's just his approach of how he how he has introduced these concepts and these ideas and the necessity. But he's calling both both peoples um, to faith and repentance in Christ. He's proclaiming the judgment that is to come. So you you know how how I preach to people here in my section of the United States, there are more people who are somewhat familiar with the scriptures. It's going to be totally different from how I preached in Australia sometimes amongst people who have had no background with the scriptures or very little background. You know, I had people in Australia who would come to church uh, and they had never been to church before, never had stepped inside of a worship service so i had to explain to him what what we were doing uh, in the context of the worship service and this is a western australian is considered a western culture but they have so much moved away from their christian roots and heritage that you have to do that how you preach the gospel in japan might be different from how you preach the gospel in mindanao or in cambodia you're going to have to tailor it you know, if, if you, let's say in Cambodia, you're dealing with a lot of people out of a Buddhist background. And, 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 and maybe some places you're also going to have to deal with a mixture of folk religion uh, there. Um, if you're going to be in an area that's primarily Muslim background, uh, how, you, how you go about establishing the truth of the gospel in these places is going, you're going to have to do it. You can't take how you preach to Muslims and preach to Buddhists that way. Or uh, preaching to Westerners, um, you, you're going to have to be very careful in understanding the culture and what they know and what they think they know about the gospel. Because sometimes what they think they know about the gospel isn't the gospel. Okay? You, you have people who who well, if I live a good life and I'm I'm kind to people and I give money to charity and, and I go to church from time to time uh, and I'm not cheating on my wife, I'm going to go to heaven. I've got these good works that I'm doing. And I, and I think Jesus is my savior. 
No, it's not your belief in Jesus plus these things. It's in Christ alone. And you need to understand all of our good works are as filthy rags in God's sight. Um, and so how you how you do this. Now, the differences in the cultures um, can lead to issues in the church, matters of sexual immorality. Um, for instance, in the Greek pagan cultures, um, you know, you did not you did not commit adultery with another man's wife. That was a very heinous offense. But if you went out and and uh, had sex with a prostitute and you were married, that was okay. Or if you did that to one of the servant girls. But if another man came and had sex with your wife, that would be adultery and that was frowned upon. Uh, you also could commit homosexual acts on little boys. And so, uh, for instance, when Paul talks about the law in Galatians, we were under a guardian. Uh, the law was a guardian for us. He uses a term of a of a very trusted slave who would escort little boys from their home to their place of school and back because of uh, predators who would grab little boys and um, sodomize them, have have sexual relations with the little boys, and the culture didn't think anything bad about that. But you protected your your children. And so the law in that way was a protector of God's people uh, during that time. And so, you know, now you've got people who've been converted out of that pagan background. Now you've got to say, oh, wait a minute, guys, you need to understand, according to the ethics of God's word, this is, you don't do this. This is sin. You know, adultery means, you know, you, you, you have one woman, you have your wife, and she alone is to be the object of your sexual uh, attraction and desires and 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 nobody else. It's exclusive. And that was the Jewish mindset. And some people would say, oh, you know, and but it was based upon God's word. Uh, but some well, that's just a Jewish approach to marriage. No, it's a biblical approach to marriage, and you need to say, no, this is what the Bible says. It's not just a Jewish thing, but we are to conform this way. But people don't change their ways of doing things just overnight. And it takes a while to kind of lay down the foundation of thinking and, and mindset and, and working these things in from their heads to their hearts. And so the early church struggled with these sorts of, of things um, that would take place, you know. Uh, so Paul addresses these by stressing the principles of the new covenant and the creation. And so he's applying this rule throughout. Also, Paul, realizing he's under Christ's rule, uh, could choose to enter Jewish culture, or he could choose not to. Um, he could choose to follow Gentile practices, and that would be helpful uh, to his mission. Um, neither the Jewish culture or the Gentile culture uh, had a hold on him. His allegiance was ultimately to Christ. And so the uh, Christ's rule was the only thing constrained him. Now, when he takes Timothy, and you remember, Timothy has a Jewish mother and a Gentile father. He has Timothy circumcised because he's going to take Timothy along with him to help him. Now, Timothy is not circumcised because of Paul's desire to follow uh, the, the sign of the covenant under the old administration of the covenant. He isn't, he isn't being circumcised for that reason. Um, he's being circumcised because he's being around Jewish folk, and this will help make him more acceptable to the Jewish folk. And so Paul's not doing it for a religious reason in adherence to the law, the Old Testament law. He's doing this in order that there would not be an offense uh, 
attached to the gospel message. Oh, he's traveling with that uncircumcised Gentile uh, who comes from a Jewish mother and a Gentile father. But in other places, if somebody's coming from a strictly Gentile background, he's not requiring them to be circumcised in order to work alongside of him. And so he's, you know, whatever it takes in order to be uh, acceptable in that sense and not give uh, offense um, needlessly in, in the spread of the gospel itself. And so Paul's attitude to this matter illustrates that Paul's concern is directed to the underlying thinking, the principle behind the actions rather than to the action itself. To Paul, the same act was either one to promote the gospel and be circumcision uh, for Timothy so as not to be an offense, or it was an act of rebellion, pride, and apostasy, as in the Galatians, uh, when it was insisted upon that circumcision was necessary in order to make somebody a Christian believer. And Paul's at him is, and says, oh, no, 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 that is not the case. And so it's the underlying motive that Paul is addressing and, and examining thing. And so, for instance, while missionaries are free to accept or reject uh, cultures, they are not bound to them. I'm not bound to Western Southern American culture if I am in mission someplace. My allegiance primarily is to Christ. And so I'm not there to promote American, Americanism. I'm not there to promote American ideas and, and, and how we do things and our customs and so forth. That, you know, that, that's not why I'm there. I'm there for Christ and to serve him. And you in the same regard, if, if, wherever you are ministering, even if you're among your own people, your own ethnicity, your own culture, your own language. You're not there to promote your culture or your ethnicity or your language. You're there to promote Christ and to serve him. And that's why you become all things to all people in order to win some uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, the next principle, principle 32, is although a missionary is not bound to the culture, he can and he should take up trappings of that culture so as not to make offense. Uh, for instance, uh, some of the early missionaries uh, that went from the West to China adopted Chinese clothing, and some of the men would wear their hair long in a queue you know, a long braid in the back and would look like Chinese people and not look like strange Westerners. Well, they would look strange anyway because sometimes they would be called long noses and, uh, and so forth. Um, sometimes uh, in Asian cultures, Westerners, especially Americans, are sometimes called uh, butter stinkers because we eat a lot of dairy products milk and butter and cream and so forth. And so uh, our, our body odor uh, is carries some of that. Whereas, you know, the type of foods you eat, the cooking oil you use, uh, you know, the types of spices and so forth, your body odor might be different and so forth. And so understanding, oh, I'm, you know, if I'm ministering in a place, I don't want to be my body odor to be offensive to somebody because of what I eat. And so I learned, you know, I adapt in order that it would not create uh, unnecessary offense. I, if they're going to be offended, I want them to be offended because of the gospel and not because of me. And so you have to be wise. You have to be thinking about this, of what you do, what you don't do, what's offensive, what's, uh, what's not offensive in a particular place. Um, you know, it, it it's different in the culture where I live here in the Southern United States. If somebody does something for you, you write out a thank you note, a formal thank you note, and you, you mail that to them very quickly. Whereas in some cultures, just a simple thank you is sufficient. Um, I had a German lady in one of my congregations that I served here in the United States, and she had 
had done some particular sewing uh, uh, needlework for us. And I, you know, we had told her thank you at church, but then we also sent her a thank you note that we had written out a little letter. And she came up to me the next Sunday and said, look, you don't need to send me that. Just a simple thank you. That's all that suffices for the Germans. You don't have to do above and beyond. They think it's a bit overboard. Whereas in my culture, it would be, um, it, it, it might be offensive if you didn't. And so my mother would, when I was a, a child, you will write you this thank you note, you will do this and so forth. And so whenever, uh, when I was in seminary and it was, it was in the Southern part of the United States, we had a teacher who told us, look, make sure if you're gonna be ministering in the Southern United States to write thank you notes. It's just part of the culture. You need to do that so you don't give unnecessary offense and get people upset with you. So uh, we have to learn from uh, the cultures and figure out, okay, what are things that we can do? What are things that we should not do when we're in those areas? Uh, um and uh, let's see. And also we saw that uh, the key issue is not the act, it's the motivation behind the act as well. All right, let's understand cultures within creation. Um, Paul describes the cultures of the world under the heading of powers or elements of the world. Um, and uh, the complex rules and prohibitions that exist in various cultures. Um, and uh, sometimes these are negative. The, the basis and the assumptions behind them are part of the embrace of rejection of the creator and worshiping the creature, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter one. And they flow out of that kind of thing. Um, you know, and certain certain habits are things that, you know, culturally are picked up and things that you do or you don't do and, and so forth. You know, in some cultures, it's offensive if you wave at somebody with your left hand uh, or if you make a gesture with your fingers, you know, uh, certain things behind them. They have religious context to them. Um, and so... Uh, the the various cultures that we have arise out of our religious assumptions, how we think about God, how we think about law, how we think about the world, what we think about ourselves. And the farther away culture is from the truth of the gospel and its assumptions, uh, it's, it, it will have an effect on, on the culture and how uh, things are done. Um, and so a way that we can assess a culture, if we're going into it, including our own culture, is through uh, the scriptures, uh, we look at this particular triangle here. At the top, you've got scripture. And on one side, you have our the missionary culture, the culture that the missionary comes from. And then the culture of the convert, the person uh, who has been reached with the gospel itself. And uh, this uh, is a way that we can go about assessing this. Now, a culture, what is a culture? A culture is a way of living, uh, an outlook, a practice that is shaped by and shapes a local community. And that culture comprises the languages, uh, the ideas, the practices, the laws, the social customs, uh, and these are learned in community. You grow up with them. You're taught them. This is the, the basis of, of how you view the world and how you exist within this world as your community uh, that shares this culture you're brought up in this. This is kind of the air that you breathe. These are the how you view things. This is how you interact with others. Um, 
in this. And, and this is something that gets passed down from generation to generation. Uh, different languages have different words to define uh, the environment around them and the, and the assumptions. So language is an outgrowth of culture. Or uh, now this is, this is something, for instance, uh, the, the languages are adapted for the particular culture. They say among some of the Native Americans and Eskimos in Alaska, they may have 25 or 30 different words for types of snow. And, and you know, uh, because this is the environment they live in. And you know, is this a powdery type of snow or is it a wet snow? What, what are the characteristics of it? And so forth. That's important because that affects things like their hunting, it affects uh, how they would build their ice houses, the igloos, how they would... Um, uh, you know, go hunting for different types of, of animals and so forth. You know, what's dangerous, what's safer and so forth. And so uh, also too, culture is not something that remains fixed in the same all throughout. We all know that. And, you know, I'm, I'm almost 67 years old. Uh, my culture has changed quite a lot in my 67 years. I imagine in your in the places where you live, you remember before there were mobile phones and how things were, you might, uh, you might even be old enough to remember before motorbikes, I don't know, uh, or, or pe more and more people having them. You, you might remember uh, the first time you might have seen somebody with a, a white, a lighter skin tone. It might be, you know, the cultures change and how we're affected uh, by things, um, and the various, uh, the various, uh, uh, ways that we deal with language changes from generation to generation, but it also changes when we come in contact with other cultures as well, more Western style clothing, more, uh, various, uh, dishes that we prepare and recipes, you know, um, we eat far more foreign influenced dishes in my home than when I was a child growing up. So we eat more types of food from India or from Asia or from Africa than when I was a kid uh, growing up. It's just the various cultures as uh, we come together. And so the difficulty for us as a missionary is to respect a local expression of culture while still changing the culture by the power of the gospel. Um, and, and to be able to distinguish between my own culture, the missionary culture, and the gospel principles. Um, and we have to remember uh, that my own culture is not neutral. Um, it's affected by sin. It's affected by uh, rebellion against God is affected by, in some ways, also by the gospel, the influence of the gospel over, over the generations as well. All cultures must be brought under the lordship of Christ, though. And so, as you see here on this triangle, the missionary culture, the convert culture, we all must answer to Christ, to his word. That is the standard by which you and I must live and how that is to influence my culture, your culture, all cultures everywhere brought under Christ. And so the cultures of the world are all subject to the scriptures. Now, the degree to which they're subject to the scriptures is an issue. If you have a, you know, Muslim culture is not subjected to the scriptures in its assumptions. Uh, a pagan culture uh, in Nepal is not su subject to the scriptures, but they are subject to the rule of Christ. They are subject to the scriptures. They're out of compliance. They're out of accord. They're acting contrary to scripture and therefore God's judgment is upon them. Uh, and so uh, we, and the effects of rebelling against God are seen in those cultures more and more, but we all must be submitted to Christ and, and uh, to his world.
Now, as let's say your culture, you're, you're taking the gospel to somebody of another tribe or someone of another culture, your culture and their culture soon you're going to see there are theological differences there are um cultural differences and and those kinds of things are going to be exposed um now that can be positive that can be a good thing because it challenges us is my culture right is it in accordance with scripture or not and there's some things, you know, when I go to Indonesia and the brothers there, they look at the uh, the immorality here in the United States and they're heartbroken. They're heartbroken over over the, what they see in going on in our culture. And does it does it grieve you, John? Does it does it affect you and affect your people and your your churches? How how can you how can you as a people? You're supposed to be a Christian people. Um, how, how is it that, why is it that you put up with these kinds of things? How, how is it that you live in that? And it's, it's uncomfortable to, to deal with that. And, and yet it is true. And so we have to be willing because sometimes it's going, our, our interacting with other cultures, there might be things about our own culture that are exposed that are unbiblical, unbiblical things. And we're going to have to Lord, help help me in my own culture to live for you and your glory. <laughs> but it also exposes unbiblical things in the in the other culture as well, and can make them uncomfortable if if their concern is to live for Christ and desire to uh, live for Him. And so, you're going to be exposed to new ideas, and that might expose things that you've accepted that you've taken for granted. And that drives you back to the scriptures and uh, allows the scriptures to shed light upon those issues and leading you to a deeper understanding of the truth. You're going to be forced to reevaluate your own culture as well as the culture, culture into which you are going. Um, and this is an ongoing process in a missionary's life. It's also difficult if you have somebody who has been living in another culture as a missionary for quite some time, more and more of the local culture, various ideas and concepts and ways of living enter into his thinking. And so when he goes back to his home culture, he becomes more and more uncomfortable. Now his thinking has shifted from what it was like in his home culture, and it's not quite all the way to the other culture, it's kind of in a third culture uh, setting. And when you bring up your children in that, um, there's what's known as third culture kids. Um, they're, they're not either in mom's culture or in dad's culture or, in, you know, say culture from the United States or culture from the Philippines or Cambodia. Um, it, they're a third thing. And, and so it's a, they're having to adapt as well. Uh, they're not at home in either place in some regards. They are home, you know, maybe if they've been a place serving as missionaries with their parents for a long time, but they're not fully accepted all the way as if somebody, as if they were somebody who was born into that culture and raised within. And so they can be lonely. Uh, for them in those particular contexts. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know a number of, of people who've been brought up uh, as missionary kids, and it's, it's a tough thing because um, you're not of your parents' culture. You're not fully of the culture of the place where you've been ministering, although you, you understand more the ideas and this is how you, this is where you've been living. But, um, it, it, it can be a diff different thing. And, and that's, again, where we go before the Lord. Lord, help me. Empower me to live for you uh, in this culture, to understand, to think through these things. So you're forced to confront and to reassess aspects of your culture and theology of where you are. 
and uh, the mission to the Gentiles self-consciously forced the church to reevaluate uh, many things and to bring the gospel to bear uh, upon them. And so uh, cross-cultural ministry is something that is um, can be very difficult, very challenging, but also very rewarding. And you are bringing the gospel to bear uh, to other places. Now, something else to understand. The cultures of this world are all part of the old creation. Okay? The languages that we have, you know, from the Tower of Babel and God confusing the languages and spreading people out throughout the world and our language, they're all part of the old creation. And so they're not going to be um, Cambodians in heaven. They're not going to be Filipinos in heaven. They're not going to be uh, Southern Americans. In, and they're not going to be people from India in heaven. They're going to be Christians. They're going to be those who are new creatures in Christ Jesus. That's who, that that is what God is doing. And so he is breaking, you know, Ephesians talks about God has broken down that wall of partition between uh, Jew and Gentile. There was a physical wall around the temple in Jerusalem with signs on various gates going into the temple that Gentiles may not enter there, uh, enter through there upon penalty of death. And so they could be outside that wall and they could worship towards the temple. That was known as the court of the Gentiles or court of the nations, but they couldn't go beyond that. Paul says, God has torn down that wall and Jew and Gentile may worship the Lord together as a new man, a uh, new person in Christ Jesus. And so all of our cultures are part of the old creation. They're not going to be carried over into the new. Now, we can appreciate what we've got here and now and do that, but we need to be careful. Uh, we're not going to be Filipinos. We're not going to be Cambodians. We're not going to be uh, from India. We're not going to be Americans in heaven. That might have been our old but we're going to be in Christ, and that's what is the important matter there uh, as we're there in, in, in heaven. And so we, uh, one of the ways that we uh, seek to uh, work in this transformation process, preparing us for this new creation in the context of the church, is by keeping the unity of the faith in the bond of peace. Uh, there's one baptism, one Lord, one God and Father of us all. And what are ways we can do that? Well, we teach the same doctrine. We teach theological unity, uh, that we are united in Christ. We are the body of Christ, uh, both in our congregation and universally as well. Christ is not divided. So uh, the church is to be one as the body of Christ, the temple of the Lord. And so unity in Christ breaks down the great cultural barrier. We keep the focus on Jesus. We keep the focus upon him. He is the one who unites us. We're not united because, oh, we're all Cambodians here, or oh, we're all Scots-Irish here. We, we are united because of Christ Jesus. Uh, second, uh, we keep our churches informed of one another. We have contacts with each other. We, we, we are encouraged by that. So we hear reports, you know, we pray for our persecuted brothers in Pakistan or in parts of India. We pray for churches in Africa. We pray for our brothers and sisters in South America. We pray for those down the down the road from us we pray and we keep informed we keep those bonds that communication together and we realize we are one in christ jesus that is important for us to to understand and to be thinking about you know we we're being prepared for the new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells and and we we communicate back and forth. You know, uh, Paul writes, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. 
what's going on with Paul? What's going on with the gospel ministry and the other churches? I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your heart. So the expectation is Tychicus is going to come back and give a report. <laughs> and all the churches you know, you are informed with each other. So there's this flow of information. And this uh, promotes uh, unity. And so the theological unity, uh, informed communication, and then practical acts of love that we have. You know, uh, the churches in Asia Minor and in Greece took up a collection to send to Palestine to help the Jewish believers who are undergoing a famine. And so practical things, a way we can assist one another uh, in the Lord. Um, there is a, um, back in the 1840s, uh, the Choctaw tribe, along with several other Native American tribes, were removed from their lands in the southeastern part of the United States and transported over into what is now the state of Oklahoma. That became Indian Territory. And these are, you know, it was very, very hard times for them. You know, you've been uprooted from your homes and and you and and transported there. Now you've got to build a new life there. And they've they've only been there maybe 10, 15 years at most. And still it's a struggle. They're building up. Well, they heard of a famine taking place in Ireland. And the Choctaws took up a collection amongst them because many of the Choctaws were Presbyterian believers. And they took up a collection, they sent it to Ireland. And I think it was like 25 or $40, which is a lot more than the buying power. So, you know, it would be equivalent to probably about two, $3,000 today. But these are fairly poor people who took up that, but they sent it to Ireland. And the Irish people were just overcome by they're, they're concerned about us. And so there are memorials both in Oklahoma and the Choctaw Nation and in Ireland uh, itself to that act of love uh, between the, the peoples and, and the Christians of the, of the places between the two. And this is one of the ways, you know, you're building together this unity. And so part of that, the Irish um, have several university scholarships available for children of the Choctaws to come over to Ireland to study in the universities. And this is something that happened almost 200 years ago. So these, these are the kinds of things that help keep the unity of the church. And so principle 35, you're balancing and uh, respecting diversity and promoting unity within the diversity of the cultures, but also the unity of the church. The focus is Jesus Christ. He is at the center of all that we are. So cross-cultural ministry is a major theme throughout the book of Acts and indeed all of the New Testament. The Jewish church was forced to meet cross-cultural challenges as she emerged from Israel to evangelize the Gentile nations. This is a process and the church grew into it. And so this is the unit on missions, and I, I thank the Lord for the opportunity to share it with you. God willing, next week, we will begin a new module. I think it'll run 13 to 15 times uh, lessons uh, on planting churches, starting churches. And a lot of what we learned here in this course will also cover as well in the next course dealing with planting of, of churches and uh, the particular blessings and challenges uh, that we have there. Well, Brother uh, Rocky, would you mind closing us with prayer, please? I know it's a little bit later than uh, we've gone in the past. It's all right. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the lessons that uh, we we heard from you. Thank you uh, in behalf of all the students of the Lord Seminary. Uh, Pastor John, we might need not to be able to write a note of thank you, but uh, so let it suffice for us to say this in person that we are very grateful for your services. 
for the cause of God and of truth. Well, may God be praised. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, uh, Lord in heaven, we thank you because uh, you are very generous to us of share, uh, giving us uh, giving us the opportunity to know you more, to know more of your word. We thank you for using uh, ministers that you sent uh, in this world, like uh, Pastor John. We thank you for his uh, efforts and his uh, uh, teaching. And we pray that you will all, always use him and uh, may uh, his, uh, 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 the, the lessons that we heard from him uh, be useful to us also. As we also minister in our uh, diverse congregations in Asia, and uh, we pray that you will grow your church in Asia, that you send more reformations in our churches. And we pray, Father, that uh, as we continue to learn from Pastor John, that you also uh, give us the, uh, the growth that we have in Christ. And uh, we pray that you uh, sustain the ministry of the Lord Seminary. These things we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, see you uh, next week. And uh, Thank you. I, uh, may, maybe, uh, Pastor John, can, can we remain just a, a couple sure. of minutes uh, after uh, uh, everybody is out? Okay.